Hey everyone, uh, this is Mike Kramer of Mock Capital Management. Today is Thursday, August 31st. It's around 7.30 p.m. New York time. So tomorrow is the big day, uh, September 1st. We're going to get two big reports that are going to really close out the week into the three-day weekend here in the U.S. for the Labor Day holiday. Um, so far to this point, we've gotten a lot of economic data. It's given us a lot of information about where inflation is, where growth may be, but ultimately speaking, this job report is going to carry some importance, especially since this is gonna be the last job report ahead of the September Fed meeting, with really only one major data point left after this for the Fed uh, to decide whether or not it wants to proceed with a rate hike in September. Uh, so this BLS job report is gonna have a lot of weight. Um, estimates are for 170,000 jobs to be created in the month of August, down from 187,000. As always, we're gonna to wanna to watch revisions because revisions have certainly been meaningful over the past year. Uh, we're also gonna to wanna to watch the unemployment rate, 3.5% expected to be unchanged. Average hourly earnings, this obviously is a very big sticking point, 0.3% month over month. Uh, last month, 0.4%. Average hourly earnings year over year, 4.3%. Last month, 4.4%. There's been some people paying more attention to this average work weekly hours, 34.3%. And then at 10 o'clock, we're going to get the ISM manufacturing report. We're looking for 47 up from 46.4. Prices paid going from going to 44 from 42.6. And so this is a bit of an interesting scenario um, where you get a job report and an ISM report on the same day. And the ISM manufacturing report carries a lot of weight just because it's one of the first reports for the month uh, and it gives us a really good and it, it kind of sets the tone in terms of you know what the rest of the data for the month of August may look like. Uh, so I kind of thought about you know recent times and when we've had this same phenomenon happen and it actually happened back on January 6th and in this case it was the ISM services index that was reported but still an ISM data point. And in the case of the January numbers, you got a strong non-farm payroll. Uh, you got a better than expected unemployment rate. You had average hourly earnings year over year coming below expectations. So overall, strong hiring, strong unemployment rate. And what we got was a market that uh, gapped higher and then gave all those gains back into 945. Now, whether or not the sell-off would have continued or not, we will never know, right? But then the ISM services data comes out at 10 a.m. and the estimates were for 55 and it comes in at 49.6, suggesting that the services sector is now in contraction. And so, of course, if, you know, the way the market thinks bad news is good news, this means the Fed isn't going to raise rates anymore. We're going into a recession. Services have cracked. And, you know, that means the Fed is done, right? Of course, that wasn't ultimately correct, but the market responded in that manner. And so what this was is that you got this giant rally going on the rest of the day uh, with basically, you know, finishing the day up here. Um, you know, so you had nearly a move from 38, you know, call it 3809 at the low to a high of 3902. So almost 100 S&P 500 handles in one day, a monster intraday move, right? And I, so I'm bringing this up because I think it's worth knowing that the data that comes at 8.30, while it's very important and is likely to influence the market greatly, um, it has the possibility of being trumped by the ISM data point that comes at 10 o'clock. And so I would just be aware that you have these two major data points coming because they're going to have an effect on the market. And more importantly, they're also going to have an effect on rates and they're going to have an effect on the dollar. So when we look at the S&P 500, uh, the, 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 the things that really stand out to me, first of all, is this straight pattern here. It, it is a pattern we've seen a lot over the years, uh, especially in the past two years. Um, and here's an example of it here where we just got this sharp rally. We stalled out for a couple of days and then gave it all back. Um, there's other examples of it like here uh, back in May, you got a big sharp rally and gave it all back. So this pattern doesn't look all that different from those. And so 
the way I'm thinking about this uh, from two standpoints is number one, we still have a bump and run pattern in here. It's not really, I'm not really convinced at this point that this has been broken. We haven't moved in further enough away from the uh, from the bottom trend line to suggest this pattern is not in play. Number two, we came down to and closed right on that trend line today. Uh, number three, if we gap below this trend line tomorrow, I think there's a good chance this whole thing gets erased. Um, and the jolts trade is unwind, essentially. The scenario that leads to higher prices would result in basically the index quickly taking out 4535 and then being able to just continue to move up from there. And I think that ultimately leads to a move up to 4550, which is where the call wall is as of today. Uh, and if you could pass 4550, you're talking about a move up to 4580 and filling this gap. Um, and that's sort of where we are on the S&P. If we move over to the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ has made some progress, a uh, little bit more progress, that is, than the, than the S&P, because uh, we were able to get back above this trend, this support level, um, and we were able to get back up to this 15,560 region. And this is your resistance level at the moment. Um, clearly, again, we closed closer to the lows today than the highs uh, in terms of the intraday movements. Uh, we want to really see the NASDAQ gap above 15,560 tomorrow. If that happens, I think it obviously opens the door to 15,720. Um, if for some reason we were to not be able to surpass these levels, I think just like the S&P, the NASDAQ is susceptible to this whole rally being erased. I, I don't know that there's really like an in-between scenario because it, it feels like once these levels are broken, the the momentum can just can really uh, pile up. When we look at the Dow, it's a little bit more convoluted, I think, because there's just so many strange things going on in this index at this point. Number one, we had what looks like a bearish engulfing pattern again in the Dow. Um, we've seen these now a couple of times in a couple of different indexes over the last couple of weeks. Um, the Dow is obviously very close to its 50-day moving average, very close to its 10-day exponential moving average. Today, you can see it comes up, test resistance at 34,990, 35,000, gets above it, fails, closes lower, closes almost at the lows of the day, um, and just not, uh, and overall, just not a very bullish sort of uh, day for the Dow. And Again, I think the Dow has a much harder path here because, again, for the Dow, it's all about getting over 35,000. Uh, if you go back below 34,600 for a second time, it seems more likely than not that you're going to go back down to 34,170. And then from there, obviously, the, the door is open to much lower levels. So this is your second attempt at this area. And for the Dow, it needs to really clear this 35,000 100 region or so to really see a meaningful advance back up to 35,300. Um, uh, anything sort of move down tomorrow and a break below 34,600 really sets up what could be an ugly day, I think, for the, the Dow. And honestly, if you're going to see the Dow starting to move down sharply, it's going to be a probably a pretty negative day for the markets overall. So you, you have these two scenarios that I think are are very uh, very far ranging, and you could you could see a very big up move tomorrow in in the S and P and in the Nasdaq, um, or you could see a very large sell off. And I, I think at this point, it's um, I don't know that there's really an in between, you know, because you're talking about a move back up to in a gap fill of forty five eighty of almost one and a half percent. Likewise, if you were to break down and return to 4430, you're talking about a drop of about 1.6%. And I think that's just where the market is. And I, I mean, if we just check one other thing, uh, if you look at the dollar index, the dollar index is also sort of telling you the same thing here. Because, you know, again, we came back down, we tested 103, got back above 103 and a half. And again, if you get stronger data that's supportive of, Again, the U.S. outperforming the rest of the world, the dollar is just potentially going to run. 
and it, it can it can make a meaningful move back lower, undercut the euro, and really start to really start advancing against the euro. So I, I think in general the whole market is sort of set up in the same way. Here's your 10-year treasury rate. Again, just sitting on support at 410. A break of 410 obviously sets up a move down to four. Likewise, if you hold 410, you're talking about the potential to move up to 420. So I think tomorrow, while it's supposed to be the day before Labor Day, I think there's a chance that you could see some pretty big moves in the marketplace following these two big important data points. So I think, you know, again, 830 is the BLS job report, but do not forget about the ISM data point at 10 o'clock because that can be just as important as the job report. So anyway, have a great rest of your day and I'll, I'll see you next week. Bye.